Hello and welcome to Principles of Cognitive Neuroscience Part A. As you may know, the course is divided in three parts. The first part, we will speak about the main models, the way people imagine the brain works. How does it work? We don't know. We'll talk about it there. Uh, the main concept, what define a result? When, when do you stop and say, oh, I got a result about the brain and I want to publish it. Um, so here we'll uh, speak about the main concepts that define a result that is uh, publishable. And the last part, our practical course, it will be uh, live and online on Zoom uh, with you students and um, they will not be recorded. So you got to be here and uh, do it with me, I'm afraid. Today, uh, most of what I'm going to talk about, you can find it in my book, Atlas of Human Brain Connections, published with Oxford University Press, uh, but also in two papers that I've been uh, publishing a few years ago, one in Cortex, which is entitled Beyond Cortical Localization in a Clinical Anatomical Correlation, and another one which is about the limbic system called a revised lambing system model for memory, emotion, and behavior. You can find those papers for free on uh, my website, www.bcvlab.com. So, holism. So we spoke a little bit of uh, localizationism before, and as you may remember, it's all about considering the brain as a mosaic of different regions dedicated to specific functions. And then associationists came in and said, well, you know, those regions might not be that isolated and they need to work together to achieve uh, specific functions. So they need to be connected and the first region will do part of the job and then pass a relay to another region and so on and so forth to create a serial processing, and that's uh, mostly what uh, associationist uh, um, thinking is about. And then uh, came along um, another group of people who defended the model of holism, <coughs> which is not really about looking at the brain in terms of localization, not so so, it's more about like um, state and pattern of activations. And, uh, and the function does not emerge from as uh, a serial processing of information, but more from uh, a parallel interaction between brain regions and an integration process. I'll come back to that uh, later more in details. And the origin of this idea is still coming from uh, Theodore Minot, which as you may know, uh, um, gave us a classification of uh, white matter fibers into a first part, which is uh, 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 the fibers that are coming from subcortical structure to the surface and from uh, um, uh, the spinal cord to uh, the surface of the brain. Those are projection fibers. Um, another category in its nomenclature is um, uh, the connections that are connecting the right to the left hemisphere and the left to the right hemisphere, which we traditionally call commercial fibers. And, uh, and then in the end, you have uh, uh, the connections that connect within the same hemisphere, different regions um, to make those associations that we call association fibers. And so you remember the model of uh, Theodore Minot uh, uh, so the first step, as I was telling you, is a very associationist thinking of uh, a step-by-step -step processing of information in brain areas, whereby this uh, child see a candle and is attracted by the light. So the visual center sees a candle, is reaching out the light, burn his hand, and you have this information that come back to the brain of uh, his hand being burned so he can retrieve it really fast. And this is a serial processing. Um, and this is all very associationist in the way the uh, brain works. But in the writing of Minet, is is really also mentioning that the recollection 
of the burning when you touch a flame is not located in any region. The recollection is located in the association between the different regions. And this means that it's not like, you know, the processing and the ability to remember is not located in the brain. It is through the integration of the activities, the interaction between the brain regions that you can uh, create this um, uh, uh, remembrance of <coughs> the association between the flame and the burning. And this led to a parallel way of thinking in the functioning of the brain that found some support in uh, uh, the literature and methods I would describe uh, further in this lecture. Um, two interesting books that I mentioned before that are really, um, you know, help me understand uh, more about the connection and the brain. One is a, a book of Sebastian Seung called The Connectome, How the Brain Wiring Makes Us Who We Are. It's, uh, it's Connectome is looking at the entire set of connections and the fact just the fact of saying that this uh, brain wiring, wiring makes us who we are is a very holistic vision. Um, and this was a book from Olaf Spawn, which is using, who is using like a neuroimaging, uh, um, which is called uh, uh, Discovering the Human Connectome, where it gives us all this vision of how can you quantify the interaction between the brain regions, how can you look at it from the world perspective? Um, of course, I want to stress that these two books don't speak about the same connectome, even though you have a human brain on the cover of Sebastian Seung's uh, book. He's been uh, spending most of his life studying the mouse brain uh, because uh, he's using electron microscopy to decipher the human connectome at, at the level of the synapse and have such a gorgeous but complex representation of what a full connectome can be. Um, on the other hand, uh, you have the work of uh, Olaf Spohn who's studying the connectome more, you know, as, as a metaphor of the connectome because he's studying via uh, uh, neuroimaging and we're looking really at the main interaction, main bundle of large connection in the brain and we're not at all at the same level of precision as in uh, Sebastian Seung's work. Um, why are we doing that? Well, you know, because on the one hand, the work of Sebastian Seung is extremely precise and, and it is the absolute truth. Um, you know, being able to do the same thing for the human brain is is a myth. It will it will n never happen. We won't, will never be able to have uh, uh, the entire human brain um, connectome at the synaptic level. It's it's way too big in terms of information. Way too hard, and. On top of that, it is highly variable and it changed with time, as I was saying in my last lesson. So between the beginning and the end of this lecture, your connectome and the synapses, synaptic exchange that you have and the number of synapses might actually change. On the other hand, uh, the uh, uh, connectome I've described by Olaf Spahn is totally feasible because you scan people 20 minutes in the MRI scan and you're able to extract valid information how the gross connectivity of the brain is working and uh, and that's a unique opportunity to study it in our species. Now um, and that's why I'm saying this is a connectome as a metaphor because we actually don't have a, a seeing of the entire connection as Sebastian Seung is uh, presenting it. Now, when we speak about the holistic model, it's important to uh, put it in contrast with the two of the models. As I was saying, the localizationist model imagines the brain as a mosaic of areas that are dedicated to specific functions. And if you damage a brain region in this mosaic, you will have an impairment that is related to the function of this region only. 
and never impact or alter the functioning of neighboring regions. With the associationist model, it is slightly different because region work as a network and they are interconnected and they pretty much work as a hierarchical, as a hierarchical organization. Um, if you if you damage uh, one of the region inside this network, then you will have an impact on the region that are uh, connected to uh, this region, and this will reflect onto the behavior of your uh, patient. Now, with the holistic model, it is uh, it is slightly more extreme than the associationist model because everything, to some extent, is connected with everything. So if you damage a brain area, this will reflect on the entire brain and change the activity of the entire brain. And this will subsequently reflect into the behavior of your patient. And you see how those three models, which, you know, which are three ideas of how the brain works uh, and defended, firmly defended by uh, different, uh, different scientists, my fine ground proof from uh, uh, experimental evidence. And uh, I'll show you some for the holistic model. But first, let's try to uh, put our mind into uh, the mind of the researchers that uh, uh, took this path and, and try to understand how they came to uh, the point. They thought the brain is extremely complicated and everything is interconnected. Essentially, you know, when you try to do clinical neuroanatomy uh, uh, correlations, um, you try to link up uh, uh, psychological models that you can have of the brain uh, with the anatomy of the brain via the extraction of behavior uh, through uh, uh, neuropsychological methods. So here, for example, you have the red figure. Um, uh, the way you can calculate uh, correlation coefficient right under. And so the idea is uh, you make a correlation between the performance of the ray figure and some specific anatomical feature in the brain. And that inform you about where are the different boxes of your psychological model. But the problem is like uh, um, so far a long time, we didn't really have access to a uh, very refined measurement of the living human brain. You know, MRI scan is just uh, uh, came, you know, became like usable in the 80s uh, and fMRI in the 90s and tractography really came out like in the year 2000, 1999, 2000. Um, so, you know, like, researcher made just a shortcut and so like you know we don't have enough information about anatomy it's like way too complicated how about we do a closer loop just between psychological models and methodology and try to find how we can split our boxes and add new arrows inside the our model and this is how you had uh, uh, 50 years of intense uh, uh, cognitive neuroscience that was based on uh, building boxes and arrows model of the functioning of the human mind. And some of those uh, very famous models um, include, uh, for example, the mono hierarchical uh, multi uh, memory systems. Uh, that's a model from Tulving for memory, where you can separate memory into uh, different. Uh, categories and um, and so like you have for example episodic memory which is temporal event that you remember in a subjective time so you can really think about oh yeah I, I had coffee yesterday with my friend Julie and uh, we had a lot of fun and she told me this fantastic joke then you have another level of memory, which is uh, the semantic memory. It is a general knowledge and uh, it's not related to a specific event. And you'll have it, uh, uh, especially, you, you know, you can define what a coffee cup is or what a joke is, but you never can relate it when you learned what a coffee cup is. 
and then and then you have the procedural memory with memories that are like operation operation involved in executing task so you just know how you don't even have to think about it uh, you don't think about how you're going to drink this cup of coffee you just take it with your hand bring it to your mouth and it is all automatic you don't even think about it okay those three level of memories uh, we know they belong to different boxes because they can be impaired uh, separately in uh, different um, in different patients uh, for example episodic memory you get the case of Henri Molaisen that I spoke about in the previous lesson who had surgery and lost the ability to build new uh, event memory after his surgery um, you have the semantic memory impairment typically um, um, in semantic dementia, uh, where where uh, uh, where people have a progressive damage of their brains that leads them to completely lose uh, the semantic of things, and uh, you have some uh, uh, more rare cases of uh, people who lose completely uh, uh, procedural memories. I um, believe uh, some uh, Parkinson patients can show that. Um, so they, leave the, they lose really the knowledge of the procedure, how to uh, do things such as like uh, starting the way they're gonna uh, uh, work, for example, and they need to think about it or for themselves. Um, another model that was uh, uh, also uh, interesting to mention is uh, uh, the model from uh, Marcel Mesulam, you know, steel boxes and arrows. Um, uh, where you have uh, interaction between the box, well here it's round, but let's imagine it's a box, uh, which is a top-down modulation from uh, prefrontal parietal limbic cortices, and that's a top-down modulation of attention, and that's a model for attention. Uh, and this always interacts with bottom-up modulation uh, uh, of attention, and so so this exchange is very important for your survival uh, uh, outside because uh, you need to be able to orient your attention to the things you need to do, such as uh, keeping the attention on the screen of the computer and listening to me uh, and, uh, and try to not be too distracted by what might happen, which can be uh, your daughter, for example, popping out with uh, some paint on their hand ready to uh, touch the wall and this is definitely going to capture my attention if this happens um, and uh, and those two together uh, uh, can uh, um, modulate uh, the way you distribute your attention on the outside world okay now what is interesting is uh, so, so you know the way you distribute your attention looking at brain lesion is not completely equal if you have a lesion in the right hemisphere or if you have a lesion in the left hemisphere. So if you have a lesion in the right hemisphere, apparently you can lose a lot of your distribution of your attention toward the left side of uh, space around you. If you have a lesion in uh, uh, the left hemisphere, the effect is uh, a lot, a lot, a lot less than uh, if you have a lesion in the right hemisphere, and that lets people led people to uh, build the uh, uh, imaginative model of the distribution of the attention region in the brain uh, uh, on the right part of the slide here, where you can see. Uh, so if you go at the bottom right of the slide, you can see that uh, the round represents a brain and the right hemisphere is good for distributing attention toward uh, the left and toward the right uh, ME field, you know, visual field in the front of you, while the left hemisphere uh, is really good for distributing attention toward the right but not very much toward the left. And so, so what's happening essentially is that if you damage your right hemisphere, then you will have 
uh, only the ability to orient your attention to uh, uh, the right. And if you damage your left hemisphere, you still keep some uh, capacity to direct your attention to the left and the right. Oh, the pretty smart models that kind of explain the behavior of patients. Uh, um, but at that time, it was not possible to really investigate closer uh, this, uh, this model in terms of uh, neuroanatomy. So it's all based on uh, logical deductions. Then you have uh, the um, language model, back sentences and arrows from McCarthy and Warrington that is linking a verbal input uh, from articulary output and typically the Wernicke area to uh, the uh, Broca area. Um, but this uh, system from uh, verbal input will go to verbal comprehension. So we're really in Wernicke. And then semantic and phonological transcoding, then auditory and phonological transcoding, and then an articulatory output. And so like one thing, uh, that is interesting as you see that you have two different paths. You have one path uh, that is going uh, uh, from uh, the verbal input to the verbal comprehension to the semantic and phonological transcoding to the articulatory output. And you get another one that is going from the verbal input to the auditory phonological transcoding and the articulatory output. Uh, articulatory output. And this segregate two paths in the brain for language, one which will be more uh, auditory verbal. Uh, you don't need to understand what you hear to say it. And another one which will be more semantic, okay? And we know that, you know, mainly because of uh, conduction aphasia, you know, if you disconnect uh, the arcade fasciculus between Broca and Wernicke, then uh, uh, the book says, that as a patient will not able, be able to repeat exactly what you say. So typically you tell them like, repeat after me, tomorrow I will go to uh, the drugstore to buy some uh, Coke for my daughter. And uh, the patient repeat uh, tomorrow, I will go to the supermarket to buy some Pepsi for my child. And so you see how like the verbal uh, represent, exact verbal representation, auditory phonological representation has been lost by the disconnection, but the patient is still able to reproduce sort of what you said through the semantic root okay and so we know those are two are different and uh, some work has been done and like people have been building anatomical be anatomical model behind it uh, if you're interested just drop me a message in this youtube video or on the neurostar forum and i'll be happy to provide you with the references uh, but for now, let's uh, move on to uh, the real father of the holism, which will be Carl Lashley. Um, and so the idea of uh, Carl Lashley, that that's exactly what he wrote inside his book. Um, so you see, uh, his idea was that, you see all those dots right next to his face, and now you can see that it is a dog. But if it's not moving, and if you were looking at it before it was moving, it would have been very hard for you to see that it is a dog. And that's because when all these different dots are moving together, you start seeing what it is because the role of the dot moving together is more than just the addition of the part and they convey together a message that they cannot convey alone. Okay, and that's the law behind integration is that people together can bring more than uh, the uh, simple uh, uh, addition somehow. Um, so, what he wrote is that I'm just going to stop the dog. 
uh, the law of conduction in the fibers thus far revealed are not alone sufficient for an understanding of integration. Cerebral organization can be described only in terms of relative masses and special arrangement of cross parts, of equilibrium among the parts of direction and steepness of gradients, and of the senti sensitization of final common path to patterns of excitation. And the organization must be conceived as a sort of relational framework into which all sorts of specific reactions may fit spontaneous, spontaneously. Such notions are speculative and vague, vague, but we seem to have no choice but to be vague or to be wrong. And I believe that a confession of ignorance is more helpful for progress than a false assumption of knowledge. The doctrine that the intelligent solution of problem results only through random activity and selection, and that the intelligent itself is an algebraic sum of multitudinous capacities, is largely a deduction from the reflect theory. And the reflect theory is the basics of associationism that reflects association between brain regions. But really, Carl is saying there is something more behind the interaction between brain regions that just, you know, conveying the information. There is an interaction that gave an integration that lead to uh, 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 these magic things that happen in the brain. And um, I mean, we can think about it just in terms of uh, um, modeling information. So, so we have our three models here, and uh, uh, we say on you know we have the on the left the localizationism. On in the middle we'll have the uh, um, uh, associationism, and on the right we'll have the holism. Um, so really, the idea on on the localizationism, if we reduce the brain into three regions, A, B, and C, is that each region is specific to a function. And then essentially, you can only do uh, three different uh, functions with your brain, which is you either activate A, and there will be one for A, zero for B, and zero for C or you activate B and there will be zero for A, one for B and zero for C. <coughs> or you activate C and there will be zero for A, zero for B and one for C. C. Now, with the associationist concept, the way you perceive the brain is like, okay, you still have those three regions but they have a special pattern of interaction and A is connected to C and C is connected to B to form this hierarchical organization that will produce a behavior. But if you do so, then in your model A, B, C, uh, the only thing that you can do is only activate the entire series of event, A, B and C being activated in series or nothing at all. And then, you, you know, you can only have two different states really in your, uh, in your brain uh, uh, and only one that would be related to a specific function. And now with the holistic vision, uh, what matters is really the pattern the overall state of the brain that will reflect a specific function. And in that case, everything is connected with everything. So you can take any profile of activation where A is activated and B and C is not, and that's a function. A and B are activated, but C is not, and that's another uh, 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 function. A, B and C are activated together, and that's another function. And you can take a lot, a lot more state than you can with the localizationism or the associationism models. And I just, you know, invite you to think about it and see whether the complexity of the human mind 
can be really depicted uh, uh, very well with a simple model of region in isolation or just hierarchy or if you start thinking that really maybe uh, a holistic model might get some, um, some more coverage of uh, how to link the functioning of the human brain with you know, the beauty of the human mind. Now, these ideas had like uh, some impact because uh, Carl Lashley is behind uh, the, the training of very important researchers. If you go on No Tree, uh, it's a website, you can actually see how uh, researchers are related together, who were uh, their PhD or postdoc supervisor would teach them and who did they teach and so on and so forth. Now, so if we look at that for Carl Lashley, uh, so Carl Spencer Lashley from Harvard here, um, CE train Roger Sperry, who had the Nobel Prize. Um, and then uh, if we look at Roger Sperry, he trained Michael Gazzaniga, who wrote the leaf principle of cognitive neuroscience, which is the same as the title of uh, this uh, uh, master. Aaron Zadel, who created lenses to uh, mimic myenopia. Um, Giovanni Berlucci, uh, who's from Verona, is next from here. And Giovanni Berlucci trained Maurizio Corbetta, who's now professor in Padova, he used to be in Washington University. Um, we'll talk about his work a little bit later. And uh, over there you have uh, uh, Mortimer Mishkin, and we will talk about him a little later, uh, about the what and the where pathways. And he worked a lot with Leslie and Galida on this. Uh, they did a fantastic job. And then uh, on the other side of uh, this, and all these people, trained people, you got Donald Hebb, which is the father of, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, what fire to say together, connect together. Um, uh, it's, it's really, you know, it's, a, it's like really a lot of very important people that had an impact on the way we understand and imagine the brain works that have an indirect or a direct relation with uh, Carl Lashley. And those ideas travel through time, through training. Like, uh, you know, you kind of think a little bit like uh, the people who train you in science because they somehow bias your judgment in their favor. So Roger Sperry, we were talking about, uh, who was trained by Carl Lashley, had the Nobel Prize uh, for the discovery of brain lateralization. As he was working on, uh, on uh, um, brains that were surgically separated in patients with epilepsy to minimize the impact of the epilepsy. And then he was showing things to the left hemifield, the right hemifield, and was able to uh, investigate really what, uh, what was doing the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. And that way it was really coming from this holistic vision of the brain is doing everything to, uh, for the first time, really dividing function between hemispheres. So it's kind of like, a, you know, it's a bad student of Lashley. Uh, you get the Nobel Prize. So I guess Lashley would have been very happy to know that. Um, but, um, but it's showing that, you know, you have form of localization of function in the brain anyway. It's not like all with all. Uh, you have, uh, uh, it, you cannot be absolute in the way you look at holistic uh, organization. So we spoke about uh, uh, attention just before and the way you have interaction between uh, control goal directed attention and so that will be the top down and the bottom up in the way you modulate attention around the world. And um, this is a model of Maurizio Corbetta who, uh, uh, who himself was trained by Giovanni Berlucci, who himself was trained by Jorge Spey, who himself was trained by Carl Lashley. Um, so I thought it would be interesting to give you a little bit of his work over here. 
so he studied and he was the first to put like a true neural basis onto these two systems that were described by uh, Marcel Mesulam. Uh, so I usually illustrate it this way. Um, uh, so like, you know, imagine that you're in the middle of the jungle, lost, trying to find your path to civilization. You will explore your environment slowly to collect information and eventually find this two silhouette far ahead and you'll be thinking, man, maybe I'll take the path on the right uh, because it looks like uh, there are more chance for me to find uh, my path back to civilization there. It is a slow and serial observation of your environment. It is strategic and you collect cues really uh, to make your decision. If you, you know, if you take people put them into the MRI scan <coughs> and ask them to do a task that is similar but simplified, you will find activations uh, of uh, a, a dorsal uh, area in the frontal lobe and a dorsal area in the parietal lobe, typically frontal area field and superior parietal lobe. And this is because your exploration of the environment is a strategic and voluntary uh, uh, orienting of your attention toward visual targets. And then what you can see here is a paper from my student, uh, Valeria Palatini, who's been exploring uh, uh, all that has been published on this and do what we call a meta-analysis, uh, where she uh, collected all the coordinates and this is, this represents like hundreds of papers have been doing this experiment. However, life is not always as peaceful as we would like to. And sometimes situations might be slightly different to what is expected. And uh, as here, you can see like there is this lion. And in the same situation, just this simple change will radically change the behavior of your attention. And you will have a uh, full focus of your attention onto this event and you'll take automatically the other way. And if you take like a, a, a people, put them in the MRI scan, ask them to do the same task with like an expected event, uh, their attention will be grabbed and they will automatically orient their attention towards this uh, target. And the pattern of activation is slightly different. It still involves the dorsal network, but it also involves the temporal parietal junction and the ventral frontal cortex. And this, you know, and this is really the model of Maurizio Corbetta with those two levels of, uh, uh, of modulation of attention in the cortex, uh, originally described by Mass and Mesulam uh, as uh, the modulation of attention through a top-down and a bottom-up effect, bottom-up being the lion here and top down being searching for cues uh, for your path to civilization. And as I said, like, you know, you get those uh, regions and I you know, always wanted to uh, try to understand how can the region in the back of the brain speak with the region in the front of the brain. And, uh, and that's why I started doing tractography and dissecting connections, I guess. Um, it's mostly because we didn't know and uh, so if you, if you explore the connections in the brain with the advanced model of tractography, uh, uh, we, we know from uh, uh, post-mortem dissections that there are frontal parietal connections. We know from axonal tracing uh, in monkeys that they are organized in three branches, uh, superior longitudinal fasciculus one, two, and three. Uh, superior, fascic superior longitudinal fasciculus one being in cyan, the number two in blue and in dark blue, and uh, the number three in pink. And uh, what I've been essentially been able to demonstrate is those connections exist in humans as well, and we have an equivalent in humans. Um, but always be aware that you know you can show those connections, uh, and those are mathematical reconstruction. And if you play around with the algorithm, you can eventually show whatever you want. So you always want to kind of backtrack yourself with some postmortem dissection, really dig in, uh, which you can see here. Those are uh, Klingler postmortem dissections, 
where you uh, uh, explore the connection of the brain uh, through a process which is different from uh, the study of uh, diffusion weighted imaging, uh, which I described uh, uh, in the previous course. Here you will take a postmortem brain and uh, freeze it so that the molecule of water uh, start getting condensated and break pathways of white matter according to the least resistance. It's a bit like, um, you know, when you put like a bowl of uh, beer inside your freezer and it explodes and the same thing happens inside the brain. And then when you unfreeze it, you can peel the brain and, and, and remove layer after layer and reveal the anatomy of the white matter connections there. And so you can see here that that's what we've been doing and we've been able to reproduce what we found in uh, tractography with uh, postmortem dissections. And we've been doing that like in a, a lot of uh, different uh, brains and created these average maps and we know now exactly uh, where are those connections and what they connect. And uh, so the idea was to uh, try to see whether a different branch of connections uh, are dedicated to different functions really um, and or is that like a complete mixed up and um, so that's still the work of uh, Valeria Palatini so she did it for uh, voluntarily oriented attention and automatically captured attention, but she also did it for a lot of other functions such as saccades and mental imagery, verbal working memory, spatial working memory, phonological processing, semantic processing, motor sequences and inhibition, number manipulation and emotion decision making and mirror neurons. And we looked at those maps together and we were like, nice try and those functions are really different but to be honest the pattern of activation is very similar and some of the regions you see activated are very comparable across all functions and so we were like is there you know some obligatory passages for function where you have a high level of integration um, you know, some areas like where they tend to uh, be very specific and segregate. Uh, the way we assess that is by looking at correlations. And we've seen that, you know, like they're very highly correlated. The pattern of activation of all these functions is highly correlated. And, uh, but you can see emerging some uh, uh, cluster of uh, significance. And the best way to identify a cluster of uh, correlation is to run what we call a principal component analysis. It will extract from your signal principal components, as I said. Um, it's a little bit like um, giving to your statistical software a uh, hundred different soups and asking him to extract what are like as a different ingredient of those soups and it will automatically uh, find similarities to, between all your soups and say, well, I found a lot of carrots, I got 30% carrots in this one, 40% carrots in this one, 60% carrots in this one. And then uh, they'll be, oh yeah, where well, you can find also another uh, uh, ingredient, which is broccoli, and then tell you how much is in all these different uh, uh, soups. And you do the same thing, but those are maps of neuroimaging. And the software will tell you, well, I see this area being classically activated uh, quite often. And that's, uh, that represent uh, 10, 20, 30 percent uh, uh, of the variance of your signal. Uh, this is what we did. And uh, by doing so, we realized that two components were enough to extract 70 percent of the variance of the signal, which means uh, if you use just uh, those two components, you can reproduce any pattern of activation with a 70% uh, level of precision, um, which, is, which is quite, quite impressive, to be honest. And, um, and so like the first one happened to be a ventral 
frontopietal network and the second one happened to be a dorsal frontopietal network and they intersected uh, pretty much in the middle. So what we did, we tried to see how those uh, different components like overlay with our three branches of uh, frontopietal connections and uh, um, these two components, sorry, and the intersection. Now, so what happened is that like as uh, a component uh, number two happen, which is a ventral, uh, which is a dorsal one, sorry, uh, happened to overlap a lot with uh, the superior branch of the superior longitudinal fasciculus and the component number three happened to overlap a lot. Uh, and the component number two happened to overlap a lot with uh, the third branch of the superior longitudinal fasciculus. And that was interesting and we thought like, okay, so we have a segregation in the pattern of activation that is related to segregation in uh, uh, the pattern of connections. Uh, but there is also a lot of overlap uh, between these pattern of activation. So we thought like, how about we try to look at what is systematically activated across all functions. And we came out with this network, uh, which, uh, which involves a, must be, you know, the premotor cortex and the uh, intraparietal sulcus, which is always activated, whatever you do. And this, that is always activated, whatever you do, overlap mostly with the second branch of the supernatural fasciculus. So we were like, oh, wow, that must be like such a high level of processing or integration there. And as a matter of fact, um, John Duncan published this uh, fantastic uh, review about the multi-domain system of the primate brain, uh, mental program for intelligent behavior, whereby he's saying that somewhere in the brain you have this network which is highly integrative, uh, where, where everything is, is combined together. And if right in into his abstract uh, that we're gonna read together where he says uh, a common or multi uh, pattern of frontal and parietal activities associated with diverse cognitive domains and with standard test of fluid intelligence in intelligent behavior goals are achieved by assembling a series of subtasks creating structural mental programs. Single cells and functional magnetic resonance imaging data indicate a key role for the multi cortex in defining and controlling the part of such programs with focus on the specific contents of the current cognitive operation. Rapid reorganization as mental focus is changed and robust separation of successive task steps. Resembling the structure problem solving of symbolic artificial intelligence, a mental program of the multi domain cortex appears central to intelligence, thought, and action. It is a fantastic system where everything seems to converge. Um, and then, if you, you know, if you look at uh, this in the perspective of brain evolution and you put it side by side with uh, the model of um, the dual origin, sort of saying that uh, we, our brain originate from a different center, one hippocampus centric and another one which is uh, 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 olfactor centric. And then the olfactor centric followed the arrows that you can um, that you can see on the left side, on the lateral view, it went on to from the core of the brain to the lateral surface, and this will be the dark gray. And uh, uh, um, um, and the hippocampocentric uh, covered more the medial surface that you see on the top of the left left part. And, and progressively invaded the surface of the brain through evolution to converge and meet exactly where we have these uh, regions of the multi uh, domain network. So I would suggest that this network that we're talking about, the multi domain, uh, would be the network that is really really the latest step of evolution in the primate brain. Now, you know, integration 
you know, has to have some specific mechanism in terms of neuroanatomy to uh, uh, to support uh, 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 the, the functioning and the integration of the brain. And and this has been very well uh, described and um, and explained by uh, Gerald Endelman, who also had the Nobel Prize. Uh, Canada is in picture on the left. I kind of find like sort of a resemblance between Edelman and uh, uh, and Carl Lashley. Um, and so what I'm doing is, you know, I'm not going to rub his word. I have a video of him explaining his concept of what he calls a reentry, which would be essential for uh, consciousness and and the human mind as we think it works. What I'm stating is that the fundamental uh, process underlying consciousness necess necessitating uh, a particular kind of anatomy uh, exemplified by the thalamus and the cortex, the thalamocortical reentrant connection, is the process of reentry. That that reentry, of course, had to develop through evolution to give an adaptive capability that was that enhanced fitness of animals, and that is that the ability to make huge numbers of discriminations through such a system, the dynamic core, which is highly dynamic and changeable, uh, that that allowed planning and thus advantage during evolution. And that subsequent to that, the invention of language across some other reentrant domains allowed us to go to where we are, the ability to deal with truth and fiction and science and art and what have you. So, you know, essentially it's what he's saying is like you have, uh, you have this process of reentry, which like is creating a loop. He's talking about the thalamus and the cortex. And through this loop, you can maintain representation and you can manipulate them. So um, another word, uh, so if you were to imagine a recipe that you want to do, uh, uh, you like, you know, you'd be like, oh, I'm gonna use all these ingredients. And then you're like, mm, I'd like to add like a taste that is nice. So you can maintain in your head, like kind of like your recipe and the ingredients and mentally add another ingredient to start thinking, well, that would be good together. And this is only possible through this loop maintenance of a representation that you can uh, modify uh, further on uh, with the rest of the brain. And um, so this is a diagram uh, that he's doing. Uh, it's a schematic uh, uh, diagram of the rayon trend white matter fiber bundle linking distant cortical areas. Uh, so you see like the uh, gray triangle represent pyramidal neurons that comprise the bulk of neurocortical uh, gray matter. Uh, for clarity, the dense packing of axonal and dendritic arbor and the link neuron with the cortical gray matter is not shown. And the color field cycle represents excitatory neuron projecting axon that send reentrant action potential bidirectionally between areas. And so um, and the, and like, uh, 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 the, co the color overhead represents the presynaptic terminal of these axons. And then you see how the blue, the blue axon is going uh, uh, from uh, A to, from, from the region on the right to the region on the left, and the red is coming back from the region on the left to the region of the right. And this permanent loop is gonna allow you to maintain a representation, and maintaining this representation is gonna allow you to modify it. And as he say, this is a key essential process that you need uh, to manipulate information think about science and be humans as we as we are now this is the theory and uh, of course we cannot like uh, measure uh, synapses in the human brain in the living human brain as well but we have uh, some fantastic researcher who wrote an extraordinary book on how to uh, really measure the exchange between brain regions and like one of uh, the way to do that and to explore the interaction be between brain regions is actually studying in studying it in the light of the graph theory so the graph theory uh is a, is 
quite old theories that have not been invented by Olaf Spahn, but his application to uh, the brain has been invented by Olaf Spahn, who uh, happened to be uh, a former student of Edelman. So the idea behind uh, uh, graph theory is you can extract or quantify important information of uh, your network interactions through its location in a graph. So uh, if things are connected together, um, uh, those things will be uh, nodes and the connection will be called edges, you can, as you can see right next to the picture of Olaf. And then some of those nodes can have a high degree of connections with neighboring nodes or they can have a low degree of connection with neighboring nodes and that's a middle top uh, graph that you can see here. You can also measure what will be the shortest path to go from one node to another and you can see that it is shorter to follow uh, only the red path to go from the node to the left to the node to the right rather than taking uh, this uh, extra longer path going through a blue, uh, a blue sideway. Then at the bottom left, you can see also that uh, some uh, nodes can have uh, uh, a really high clustering. And so they really only connected that are to nodes that are connected between each other. Um, or they can have a high between the centrality, which means that they are connected to a lot of different clusters that are not connected between them, okay? Um, and then uh, together you can, you can find like uh, interesting things, finding like connector hubs that happen to have a higher between the centrality or provincial hub and that's really at the whole uh, brain level. And uh, so at the lower part, you have another way of uh, showing this. Uh, where you can find that uh, the orange node will be the node with the highest uh, degree uh, because it is connected to a lot of other nodes. Uh, the red node is a connector up because it connects uh, the cluster on the left with the cluster on the right. And, uh, um, and the uh, uh, purple node is uh, the highest clustering coefficient because uh, all uh, its neighbors, uh, uh, they're all connected to each other. Uh, so uh, it has a highest clustering coefficient because it's connected to uh, nodes that are only connected between them or so-so. And then you can see an example of the shortest path between two blue nodes as being the most direct path between those things. And this is really interesting because this is a way to really study the brain as a whole. You're really studying the interaction between the brain region and you're quantifying them over here, rather than looking at their localization or their just serial interaction via connections. Um, and Patrick Agman has been doing a, a, a demonstration of this by uh, demonstrating that uh, if you wanna look at the brain of schizophrenic patient versus control, you can take the entire brain and quantify the, the level of integration and segregation in their brain. And what you will see is that schizophrenic patients have significantly less integration in their brain than healthy controls and less segregation in their brain than healthy controls. Okay? And this is, this is completely holism. This is looking at the entire brain, extracting the interaction between brain and regions and relating it to specific symptoms. And that, that has been, uh, that is fascinating. It's been limited for a long time uh, through uh, the possibility to uh, really look at all the connections with diffusion. Uh, another method that's been um, uh, providing a way to look at the way brain region interact and uh, help to support more the holistic vision is a functional connectivity. Originally discovered by uh, Brad Biswell, who's been uh, uh, comparing uh, activation 
uh, during the movement of fingers to uh, not doing anything, but just looking at the correlation of activities, the shared synchronization of activity between brain regions in a single brain, you see that's exactly uh, the same pattern of activation that we can see here. Uh, make us think that actually the synchronization, synchronization of the resting state, fMRI, um, uh, the synchronization of brain areas actually reflects functional network of the brain. So we're not talking about a very dynamic signal. Actually, it is a very slow fluctuation, as you can see here in that image, whereby uh, uh, what you really think is like areas that change color at the same time happen to be areas that are connected together and work together to achieve a function. And this is happening all the time in your brain. This is your brain at rest doing these spontaneous fluctuations. And then yeah, you try to dissociate those spontaneous fluctuations using uh, mathematical models such as a uh, principal component analysis or more advanced one to segregate signals such as independent component analysis. Um, and what you can do, you can do what uh, uh, Thomas Yeo has been doing is like isolating in the brain specific network of activity and, and dividing the brain in several regions according to their profile of activity at rest. And, uh, and this works pretty well. Uh, for example, you can easily extract uh, 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 networks that match the dorsal attention network and the networks that match the ventral attention network and look at their profile of variation of both, and you can see that they do not overlap at all. And uh, you can do the same thing with uh, 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 transform with a uh, in frequency uh, and look at their power, and you see that there is absolutely no overlap between those two networks, and they do match a control goal directed attention and the grab stimulus driven attention networks. If you extend that to the entire brain, you can uh, create like a beautiful parcellation of the brain in subregions, whereby you can uh, you can see uh, uh, that uh, uh, those regions remind you some of the classical region we talk about in terms of localization, but the very much definition is that they have this profile because they interact in a specific way with the rest of the brain. And that's where, you know, you can close the loop with the localization. Uh, the primary is like, uh, where do you start? By what granularity do you stop? Do you divide the brain in seven networks? Do you divide the brain in 17 networks? How far can you go? And when do you uh, reach really the noise? Interestingly, you can decline this to as uh, a study of patients. Uh, if you decline this in uh, the study of patients, the way those uh, networks are segregated um, uh, through uh, the uh, uh, measurement of the uh, modularity is completely disturbed after a stroke. And as this modularity decreases, and um, sorry, as this modularity come back and you uh, start segregating better your network, uh, you recover a pattern of uh, uh, functional connectivity uh, that look like a, an average control and your uh, performance is getting better. So you see like, those are, like the example of the three column, uh, two weeks after the stroke, the modularity is 0 0.66, and then it's going to one at three months and it's still at one at one year and your patient recover for language. Um, uh, you know, it doesn't work systematically. Uh, for example, for motor, it was first a uh, low modularity and then a high modularity and then a low modularity again, and the patient recovered. And, um, and some other example, like for attention, are uh, not uh, clear at all. It was very low modularities and come back up and then low again, and um, you have uh, no recovery of attention. But this is an interesting track to explore 
and maybe some of those results are like uh, uh, bias just by the noise of fMRI and it's like remember that's a single uh, subject. What does it tell us for uh, the three famous cases? Can we apply this thinking to uh, the three famous cases and uh, see how this new model of holism can make us uh, uh, understand differently what happened in these three uh, pillar foundation of uh, cognitive neuroscience. So you remember Phineas Gage had a long bar that uh, went through his skull and damaged uh, his uh, medial uh, front lobe and that led us to think and came out of uh, his uh, accident with a radical change in his personality and then made us think that like a uh, personality is located in the medial portion of the frontal lobe. Um, Le Bon had this lesion in the posterior part of the inferior frontal gyrus, which tells us things that there is a broke area uh, in, the, in the brain that is uh, responsible for uh, language production um, because it was a phasic. And then Henry Molaisen uh, had surgery in uh, the medial part of his temporal lobe lost his ability to build new episodic memory, which uh, made us think that the medial temporal lobe, particularly the hippocampus, are important uh, uh, for episodic memory. And that was a, really the traditional localizationist uh, vision for it. And we revisited it by uh, looking at the connections that were damaged. In the case of Phineas Gage, he had a disconnection of the ancinate fasciculus, prevented the frontal lobe to exert, to uh, do his inhibition on the amygdala, and that's why he had all this emotional outburst. Uh, and the bar further disconnected a uh, frontal frontal connection, preventing him to uh, elaborate any planning of action, and that's why it was coming out of uh, the medical office with thin boots and forgetting to wear a jacket while it was raining and cold outside. In the case of uh, Le Boyne, the lesion has been completely destroying uh, the arcade fasciculus and uh, neighboring connections that we know are very important for language. And in the case of Henri Molaisen, as a disconnection uh, that was bilateral, disconnected the ancinate fasciculus. It didn't have this emotional outburst like uh, Phineas Gage because the medial temporal lesion also uh, removed uh, the, the, like the neurosurgeon also removed the amygdala bilaterally. Um, the disconnection of the phonics uh, is also well known for uh, leading to episodic, episodic memory disorder, especially in the case of uh, surgery of the uh, um, on cyst of the uh, third colloid, where, where no surgeon sometimes touch the phonics and patients come out with episodic memory disorders. And as uh, a cingulum that support uh, the link between the hippocampus and the retrospinal cortex is also very important for memory uh, because the retrospinal cortex we know is a place where you have the highest hypometabolism, the thinnest cortical thickness and the most of the amyloidic plaque in the case of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, forgot to mention the ancinate fasciculus is also very much linked with memory because if you cut it in primates, no human primates, uh, those primates will not be able to elaborate memories related to emotions anymore. And as you may know, emotions are very important to build episodic memories. Uh, so HM was not able to do it anymore. So in sum, you know, by looking at the white matter connection, we've been able to provide an associationist uh, perspective to uh, those three cases, uh, bringing on some explanation of how uh, 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 the brain disconnection has been impairing uh, the serial process of information in different systems uh, that led these patients to have those very typical uh, symptoms 
uh, that made us uh, uh, understand the segregation of function in the human mind. But now, how can we bring it to a more holistic vision? So um, we were like, let's you know, let's try to forget about typical white matter tracks. How about we try to build for each patient with our software that you can download on our website a map of the probability of disconnections of uh, uh, of uh, typical lesion, like for example, the lesion of uh, Phineas gauge. And also to do so, uh, we take the lesion of the patient and we project it in the brain of uh, LC participants. And we look at every streamline of connection using tractographies that are passing by as this lesion. And that allow us through averaging to produce a heat map of uh, the probability of disconnection in uh, this uh, patient. And this is map, we can project it back onto the surface of the brain. And this is what we did in the case of Phineas Gage. So you see um, a brain that is not his brain, that's an average brain that is uh, inside uh, the reconstruction of his skull with a reconstruction of the bar. You can see that the bar, yes, damaged a medial portion of the a uh, frontal lobe came out and the dorsal lateral portion of uh, the frontal lobe slapped the entire portion of the temporal lobe. By the way, we never talk about that, but it did happen. Um, and it completely disconnected the uh, prefrontal cortex as well as some posterior regions and completely disconnected uh, uh, the thalamus and the striatum from the uh, prefrontal cortex. What's interesting is now that you have a pattern of disconnections that you have on the surface of the brain, you can compare it with traditional activation in healthy controls during task of decision making and the processing of emotion. So decision making here will be on the right part of the slide and uh, you'll see it in blue and emotion processing will be in red and the overlap between the two is in pink. And uh, uh, so what you can see is that the regions that are traditionally activated during uh, those tasks are typically disconnected in the case of Phineas Gage. And if you need an interaction between all these regions to achieve these functions, the level of disconnection within these regions will siderate, block the achievement of this function. That's why uh, Phineas Gage showed those symptoms. There will be more an holistic vision of that. In the case of Le Borgne, uh, you can see, uh, and Broca never sliced his brain. Uh, if you could see through the brain, you'll see that the lesion really extends completely in the uh, Sylvian Valley and, and, and damage all the white matter behind it. And uh, so what we can see is we look at the projection of uh, the heat map of probability of disconnection. We have a full disconnection of uh, the uh, language system, uh, including the broca area, supramarginal gyrus, and uh, superior temporal gyrus. And we put it side by side with a typical activation during uh, a verbal um, uh, verbal production. So you have to like uh, uh, produce as many verbs as you can. And you see that you have an overlap between the regions that are traditionally activated and the regions that have been disconnect disconnected in the case of Le Boyne. Then, uh, then in the case of uh, Henry Molaison, so like you gotta see it's a brain that has been open in the middle, you know, and they're like opening uh, uh, sideways, like the, you, you know, you can see in red, like the lesion, which is in the medial temporal lobe that damaged completely, you know, all the medial temporal uh, lobe removes the amygdala and the pattern of disconnection is completely centered onto the limbic system, disconnecting the frontal lobe from the temporal lobe, but also they can disconnecting the, uh, limbic lobe uh, from the temporal lobe and, and, and those regions that are disconnected 
match classical pattern of activation that you find during the encoding and the retrieval of memories. Now, you'll be like, wait a minute, uh, we know about Henri Mollison deficit in encoding memories because he was not able to build new uh, recollection after his surgery, but if there was a def deficit in retrieval of memory as well, he should have not been able to retrieve memory from before his surgery. And this is where I'm saying the book says that uh, uh, Henri Mollison had only a deficit of encoding, but if you actually read the papers and if you read the book of Susan Corkin on all uh, the um, all the, the manifestation and the deficit of Henri Molaison, you will see that he actually lost about 10 years of memory before his surgery, that he was not able to retrieve anymore. So the so way his lesion has been damaging the connection within the network of activation that is dedicated to encoding and retrieval of memory, been siderating the function, blocking really the achievement of the function in there and uh, uh, prevent him to encode new memories and retrieve memories of what happened before his surgery. With these words, um, um, I'm gonna leave you with a, a video of uh, Sebastian Seung. Uh, which we talked about, um, who uh, saying that um, um, the brain wire wiring defines uh, where we are. He's going to explain it to you with these words, and I thought it would be very important that you have a vision of how complex can be uh, uh, the brain connections, and uh, why do we use neuroimaging and not uh, uh, electromicroscopy to study it in the human brain. I'll leave you with them. We live in a remarkable time, the age of genomics. Your genome is the entire sequence of your DNA. Your sequence and mine are slightly different. That's why we look different. I've got brown eyes. You might have blue or gray. But it's not just skin deep. The headlines tell us that genes can give us scary diseases, maybe even shape our personality or give us mental disorders. Our genes seem to have awesome power over our destinies. And yet, I would like to think that I am more than my genes. What do you guys think? Are you more than your genes? Yes? yes? I think some people agree. I think some people agree with me. I think we should make a statement. I think we should say it all together. <laughs> all right? I am more than my genes all together. I am more than my genes. What am I? I am my connecto. And since you guys are really great, maybe you could humor me and say this all together too? <laughs> right? All together now. I am my connecto. Oof, that sounded great. You know, you guys are so great. You don't even know what a connectome is and you're willing to play along with me. <laughs> I could just go home now. Well, so far, only one connectome is known, that of this tiny worm. Its modest nervous system consists of just 300 neurons. And in the 1970s and 80s, a team of scientists mapped all 7,000 connections between the neurons. In this diagram, every node is a neuron and every line is a connection. This is the connectome of the worm C. elegans. Your connectome is far more complex than this because your brain contains 100 billion neurons and 10,000 times as many connections. There's a diagram like this for your brain, but it would, there's no way it would fit on this slide. Your connectome contains one million times more connections than your genome has letters. 
That's a lot of information. What's in that information? We don't know for sure, but there are theories. Since the 19th century, neuroscientists have speculated that maybe your memories, the information that makes you you, maybe your memories are stored in the connections between your brain's neurons. And perhaps other aspects of your personal identity, maybe your personality and your intellect, maybe they're also encoded in the connections between your neurons. And so now you can see why I proposed this hypothesis, I am my connectome. I didn't ask you to chant it because it's true. I just want you to remember it. And in fact, we don't know if this hypothesis is correct because we have never had technologies powerful enough to test it. Finding that worm connectome took over a dozen years of tedious labor. And to find the connectomes of brains more like our own, we need more sophisticated technologies that are automated, that will speed up the process of finding connectomes. And in the next few minutes, I'll tell you about some of these technologies which are currently under development in my lab and the labs of, of my collaborators. Now, you've probably seen pictures of neurons before. You can recognize them instantly by their fantastic shapes. They extend long and delicate branches. And in short, they look like trees. But this is just a single neuron. In order to find connectomes, we have to see all the neurons at the same time. So let's meet Bobby Casturi, who works in the laboratory of Jeff Lichtman at Harvard University. Bobby is holding fantastically thin slices of a mouse brain, and we're zooming in by a factor of 100,000 times to obtain the resolution so that we can see the branches of neurons all at the same time. Except you still may not really recognize them, and that's because we have to work in three dimensions. If we take many images of many slices of the brain and stack them up, we get a three-dimensional image. And still you may not see the branches, so we start at the top, and we color in the cross-section of one branch in red. And we do that for the next slice, and for the next slice. And we keep on doing that, slice after slice. If we continue through the entire stack, we can reconstruct the three-dimensional shape of a small fragment of a branch of a neuron. And we can do that for another neuron in green. And you can see that the green neuron touches the red neuron at two locations. And these are what are called synapses. Let's zoom in on one synapse and keep your eyes on the interior of the green neuron. You should see small circles. These are called vesicles. They contain a molecule known as a neurotransmitter. And so when the green neuron wants to communicate, wants to send a message to the red neuron, it spits out neurotransmitter. At the synapse, the two neurons are said to be connected, like two friends talking on the telephone. So you've seen how to find a synapse. How can we find an entire connectome? Well, we take this three-dimensional stack of images and treat it as a gigantic three-dimensional coloring book. We color every neuron in, in a different color, and then we look through all of the images, find the synapses, and note the colors of the two neurons involved in each synapse. If we can do that throughout all the images, we could find a connectome. Now, at this point, you've learned the basics of neurons and synapses, and so I think we're ready to tackle one of the most important questions in neuroscience. How are the brains of men and women different? <laughs> According to this self-help book, Guys' brains are like waffles. They keep their lives compartmentalized in boxes. Girls' brains are like spaghetti. Everything in their life is connected to everything else. You guys are laughing, but you know, this book changed my life! But seriously, what's, what's wrong with this? You already know enough to tell me. What's wrong with this, this statement? It doesn't matter whether you're a guy or girl, everyone's brains are like spaghetti. Or maybe really, really fine capellini with branches. Just as one strand of spaghetti contacts many other strands on your plate, one neuron touches many other neurons through their entangled branches. One neuron can be connected to so many other neurons because there can be synapses at these points of contact. By now, you might have 
sort of lost perspective on how large this cube of brain tissue actually is. And so let's do a series of comparisons to show you. I'll assure you this is very tiny. It's just six microns on a side. So here's how it stacks up against an entire neuron. And you can tell that really only the smallest fragments of branches are contained inside this cube. And a neuron, well, that's smaller than brain. And that's just a mouse brain. It's a lot smaller than a human brain. So when I show my friends this, sometimes they've told me, you know, Sebastian, you should just give up. <laughs> Neuroscience is hopeless. Because if you look at a brain with your naked eye, you don't really see how complex it is. But when you use a microscope, finally the hidden complexity is revealed. In the 17th century, the mathematician and philosopher Blaise Pascal wrote of his dread of the infinite. His feeling of insignificance at contemplating the vast reaches of outer space. And as a scientist, I'm not supposed to talk about my feelings. Too much information, professor. <laughs> but may I? <laughs> I feel curiosity. And I feel wonder. But at times, I have also felt despair. Why did I choose to study this organ that is so awesome in its complexity that it might well be infinite. It's absurd. How could we even dare to think that we might ever understand this? And yet I persist in this quixotic endeavor. And indeed, these days I harbor new hopes. Someday, a fleet of microscopes will capture every neuron and every synapse in a vast database of images. And someday, artificially intelligent supercomputers will analyze the images without human assistance to summarize them in a connectome. I do not know, but I hope that I will live to see that day. Because finding an entire human connectome is one of the greatest technological challenges of all time. It will take the work of generations to succeed. At the present time, my collaborators and I, what we're aiming for is much more modest, just to find partial connectomes of tiny chunks of mouse and human brain. But even that will be enough for the first test of this hypothesis that I am my connectome. For now, let me try to convince you of the plausibility of this hypothesis, that it's actually worth taking seriously. As you grow during childhood and age during adulthood, your personal identity changes slowly. Likewise, every connectome changes over time. What kinds of changes happen? Well, neurons, like trees, can grow new branches, and they can lose old ones. Synapses can be created, and they can be eliminated. And synapses can grow larger, and they can grow smaller. Second question, what causes these changes? Well, it's true. To some extent, they are programmed by your genes, but that's not the whole story. Because there are signals, electrical signals that travel along the branches of neurons and chemical signals that jump across from branch to branch. These signals are called neural activity. And there's a lot of evidence that neural activity uh, is encoding our thoughts, feelings, and perceptions, our mental experiences. And there's a lot of evidence that neural activity can cause your connections to change. And if you put those two facts together, it means that your experiences can change your connectome. And that's why every connectome is unique, even those of genetically identical twins. The connectome is where nature meets nurture. And it might be true that just the mere act of thinking can change your connectome an idea that you may find empowering. What's in this picture? A cool and refreshing stream of water, you say. What else is in this picture? Do not forget that groove in the earth called the stream bed. Without it, the water would not know in which direction to flow. And with the stream, 
I would like to propose a metaphor for the relationship between neural activity and connectivity. Neural activity is constantly changing. It's like the water of the stream, it never sits still. The connections of the brain's neural network determine the pathways along which neural activity flows. And so the connectome is like the bed of the stream. But the metaphor is richer than that, because it's true that the stream bed guides the flow of the water. But over long time scales, the water also reshapes the bed of the stream. And as I told you just now, neural activity can change the connectome. And if you'll allow me to ascend to metaphorical heights, I will remind you that neural activity is the physical basis, or so neuroscientists think, of thoughts, feelings, and perceptions. And so we might even speak of the stream of consciousness. Neural activity is its water, and the connectome is its bed. So let's return from the heights of metaphor and return to science. Suppose our technologies for finding connectomes actually work. How will we go about testing the hypothesis, I am my connectome? Well, I propose a direct test. Let us attempt to read out memories from connectomes. Consider the memory of long temporal sequences of movements, like a pianist playing a Beethoven sonata. According to a theory that dates back to the 19th century, such memories are stored as chains of synaptic connections inside your brain. Because if the first neurons in the chain are activated, through their synapses they send messages to the second neurons which are activated, and so on down the line, like a chain of falling dominoes. And this sequence of neural activation is hypothesized to be the neural basis of those sequence of movements. So one way of trying to test the theory is to look for such chains inside connectomes. But it won't be easy because they're not going to look like this. They're going to be scrambled up. And so we'll have to use our computers to try to unscramble the chain. And if we can do that, the sequence of the neurons we recover from that unscrambling will be a prediction of the pattern of neural activity that is replayed in the brain during memory recall. And if that were successful, that would be the first example of reading a memory from a connectome. What a mess. Have you ever tried to wire up a system as complex as this? I hope not. But if you have, you know it's very easy to make a mistake. The branches of neurons are like the wires of the brain. Can anyone guess what's the total length of wires in your brain? I'll give you a hint, it's a big number. I estimate millions of miles, all packed in your skull. And if you appreciate that number, you can easily see there is huge potential for miswiring of the brain. And indeed, the popular press loves headlines like anorexic brains are wired differently or autistic brains are wired differently. These are plausible claims, but in truth, we can't see the brain's wiring clearly enough to tell if these are really true. And so the technologies for seeing connectomes will allow us to finally read miswiring of the brain, to see mental disorders in connectomes. Sometimes, the best way to test a hypothesis is to consider its most extreme implication. Philosophers know this game very well. If you believe that I am my connectome, I think you must also accept the idea that death is the destruction of your connectome. I mention this because there are prophets today who claim that technology will fundamentally alter the human condition and perhaps even transform the human species. One of their most cherished dreams is to cheat death by that practice known as cryonics. If you pay $100,000, you can arrange to have your body frozen after death and stored in liquid nitrogen in one of these tanks in an Arizona warehouse, awaiting a future civilization that is advanced enough to resurrect you. Should we ridicule the modern seekers of immortality, calling them fools? Or will they someday chuckle over our graves? 
I don't know. I prefer to test their beliefs scientifically. I propose that we attempt to find a connectome of a frozen brain. We know that damage to the brain occurs after death and during freezing. The question is, has that damage erased the connectome? If it has, there is no way that any future civilization will be able to recover the memories of these frozen brains. Resurrection might succeed for the body, but not for the mind. On the other hand, if the connectome is still intact, we cannot ridicule the claims of cryonics so easily. I've described a quest that begins in the world of the very small and propels us to the world of the far future. Connectomes will mark a turning point in human history. As we evolved from our ape-like ancestors on the African savanna, what distinguished us was our larger brains. We have used our brains to fashion ever more amazing technologies. Eventually, these technologies will become so powerful that we will use them to know ourselves by deconstructing and reconstructing our own brains. I believe that this voyage of self-discovery is not just for scientists, but for all of us. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to share this voyage with you today. Thank you. What a nice lecture. Um, so following up with this, we'll see in the next lecture that um, all these models of the brain functioning are related to the activity of neurons and their connections. But there might be some forgotten, forgotten cells in the brain uh, that we didn't talk about, which are the glial cells. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about uh, what we know about glial models and their relationship to, uh, to function. Uh, I invite you as well to join us on the 11th and the 13th of November for uh, the Brain Structure and Function Special Issue Symposium about structural connectivity of the cerebral cortex. Um, I know you won't be able to assist it live, but you will be able to uh, watch a replay on our YouTube channel. And I also invite you to join us every morning, uh, every Monday morning at 9.30 uh, for the Neurochino, during which we speak about the exciting, exciting science of the last week. Um, regarding the evaluation of this module, uh, the grade that you will obtain for the part A of this module is a combination between your attendance to the live uh, session, your participation, which is quantified as a question you will ask, whether you ask it on the YouTube channel or on the um, Neurostar forum, as well as a little project that I'm asking you to do. I would like you to write an essay on the brain hierarchy, uh, the brain hierarchy. So you got to choose a hierarchy that you want to describe in the brain and uh, write a little essay about it with a general introduction, uh, its anatomy, uh, tell me whether this hierarchy is lateralized or not, and if nobody investigated it, how would you, do you think people should investigate it? Uh, I would like you to link this hierarchy with a brain evolution and make a synthesis where you bring all this anatomy, lateralization, and evolution together. All of this in a total of 1,500 to 2,500 words, not including the words counted as references. Thank you for sending me this at my email that you can see here, michel.thiebo at gmail.com uh, before the 11th of September. This grade will be average with your grade to the part B of this course with uh, Antonino Vallesi. Um, and uh, that will give you your final, final evaluation for the entire module. I would like to thank you for your attention and I look forward to see you uh, in uh, the next um, uh, practical session. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>